And now the test is here to see if I can hear myself chat. And I'm not. Damn it. Oh, wait. Maybe? Hello? Seems to be shot. Guilty. Turn out these stupid ads out of the way. the fact I had to reinstall freaking OBS. Uh, but anyway, Sherlock Holmes tonight, that's the goofiest hat. I actually have one of these, because I like cats. I've uh, got a minute and 15 or so left on the ad, so...
Okay, and my audio, I'm hearing it through the stream, about, you know, 15 minutes after I actually say it, so I guess that's kind of an advantage, I suppose. Fifteen seconds, sir. Community is back. Supposedly. What the hell? I don't know how the hell that happened. Why don't you give me six minutes? I'm going to play my browser acting up. I, only clicked, I thought I only clicked it once. Apparently I clicked it twice. Hopefully no more than that. But anyway, we're getting into chapter 5 of Sherlock Holmes tonight. It may be a fairly short stream if I don't want to go into the actual part 2 of the book. Because the book only has 7 chapters per section. And if I go past chapter 7, I'll be going into part 2 of the book. So... So it may just be a short stream, or I may just advertise the hell out of myself. I don't know. Oh, man. Excuse me. Man. <laughs> Why does it keep making me go... That's swanky. Okay, second set of ads. Okay, maybe we're back. Okay. 
I can hear myself again, so I guess that means I must be back. That's just fucking ridiculous. I mean, I had to reinstall OBS anyway, and now I have to deal with all this startup shit again. Not that I think I ever had it set up properly, but oh well. <laughs> Let's go to the study before anything else screws up. Yay! What? Why is that window saying that I've got... Why is that one so far behind? It's still got the ads on it. Uh. Anyway, Sherlock Holmes. Valley of Fear. <laughs> Any luck, I will not have this much scuff. The subathon, which is in a week and a half. I know it's going to take the time to talk about it, but well, that time was wasted on OBS. Fireplace actually working. It looks like it is. Can you hear the? Curse you, OBS! What survived this time, I wonder? I can't remember what was on here that I was need to fix because it's driving me buggy. Uh, not that one, it is. This one? No, it's not that one. Camera. Dirty spout. Mirror video? Nope, oh, that's not it either. Oh well. Let's see how much of the book I can read. <laughs> And it, well, like I was saying during the ad break, that was twice as long as it should have been. This may be a short stream. <laughs> There's only three chapters left to this section of the book. So. Oh, do not disconnect on me again. Okay. So I may just stop at the end of the final chapter of this one, and wait until next week to continue. And with the way OBS is going, it may be a shorter stream than that. But anyway. Okay. Yeah, I need to turn off the mirror, because that's annoying. Open. No, at least be looking the right direction. So. <clears throat> Chapter 5. The People of the Drama.
Have you seen all you want of the study? asked White Mason as we re-entered the house. For the time, said the inspector, and Sherlock Holmes nodded. Then perhaps you would like to hear how the evidence of some of the people in the house. We could use the dining room. Please come yourself first and tell us all you know. The butler's account was a simple and clear one, and he gave a convincing impression of sincerity. He had been engaged five years ago when Mr. Douglas first came to Burlstone. He understood that Mr. Douglas was a rich gentleman who had made his money in America. He had been a kind and considerate employer, not quite what Ames was used to, perhaps, but one can't have everything. He never saw any signs of, ap of apprehension in Mr. Douglas. On the contrary, he was the most fearless man he had ever known. He ordered the drawbridge to be pulled up every night because it was an ancient custom of the old house, and he liked to keep up the old ways. Mr. Douglas seldom went to London or left the village, but on the day before the crime he had been shopping in Tunbrill Wells. He, Ames, had observed some restlessness and excitement on the part of Mr. Douglas upon that day, for he had seemed impatient and irritable, which was unusual for him. He had not gone to bed that night, but was in the pantry at the back of the house, putting away the silver, when he heard the bell ring violently. He heard no shot, but it was hardly possible he should, as the pantry and the kitchens were at the very back of the house, and there are several closed doors and a long passage between. The housekeeper had come out of her room, attracted by the violent ringing of the bell. They had gone in front of the house together. As they reached the bottom of the stair, he had seen Mr. Doug Mrs. Douglas coming down it. No, she was not hurrying. It did not seem to him that she was particularly agitated. Just as she reached the bottom of the stair, Mr. Barker had rushed out of the study. He had dropped Mrs. Douglas and begged her not to go back. "'For God's sake, go back to your room,' he cried. "'Poor Jack is dead. You can do nothing. For God's sake, go back!' After some persuasion upon the stairs, Mrs. Douglas had gone back. She did not scream. She made no outcry whatsoever. Mrs. Anne, the housekeeper, had taken her upstairs and stayed with her in the bedroom. Ames and Mr. Barker had then returned to the study, where they found everything exactly as the police had seen it. The candle was not lit at the time, but the lamp was burning. They had looked out the window, but the night was very dark, and nothing could be seen or heard. They had then rushed into the hall, where Ames had turned the windlass, which had lowered the drawbridge. Mr. Barker had then hurried off to get the police. Such, in its essentials, was the evidence of the butler. The account of Mrs. Allen, the housekeeper, was, so far as it went, a cooperation of that of a fellow servant. The housekeeper's room was rather nearer to the front of the house than the pantry in which Ames had been working. She had prepared to go to bed when the loud ringing of the bell had attracted her attention. She was a little hard of hearing. Perhaps that was why she had not heard the sound of the shot, but in any case the study was a long way off. She remembered hearing some sound which she imagined to be the slamming of a door. That was a good deal earlier, half an hour at least before the ringing of the bell when Mr. Ames ran to the front of the house with him. She saw Mr. Barker, very pale and excited, come out of the study. He intercepted Mrs. Douglas, who was coming down the stairs. He entreated her to go back, and she answered him, but what she said could not be heard. Take her up and stay with her, he had said to Mrs. Allen. She had therefore taken her to the bedroom and endeavored to soothe her. She was greatly excited, trembling all over, but made no other attempt to go downstairs. She had just sat in her dressing gown in the bedroom fire with her head sunk in her hands. Mrs. Allen stayed with her most of the night. As to the other servants, they had all gone to bed, and the alarm did not reach them until after, and just before, the police arrived. They slept at the extreme back of the house and could not possibly have heard anything. So far, the housekeeper, who could add nothing as a cross-examination save lamentations and expressions of amazement, 
Mr. Cecil Barker succeeded Mrs. Allen as a witness. As to the occurrences of the night before, they had very little to add to what had already been told to the police. Personally, he was convinced that the murderer had escaped by the window. The blood stain was conclusive, in his opinion, upon that point. Besides, as the bridge was up, there was no other possible way of escaping. He could not explain what had become of the assassin, or why he had not taken his bicycle, if it were indeed his. He could not have possibly been drowned in the moat, which at no place is more than three feet deep. In his own mind, he had a very definitive theory about the murder. Douglas was a reticent man, and there were some chapters of his life with which he had never spoken. He had an, an emigrated to America from Ireland when he was a very young man. He had prospered well, and when Barker had first met him in California, where they had become partners in a successful mining claim at the place called Benito Canyon. They had done very well, but Douglas had suddenly sold out and started for England. He was a widower at that time. Barker had afterwards realized his money had come to live in London. Thus they were new renewed their friendship. Douglas had given him the impression that some danger was hanging over his head, and he had always looked upon his sudden departure from California, and also his renting a house in so quiet a place in England, as being connected with the peril. He imagined that some secret society, some implacable organization, was on Douglas's track which would never rest until it killed him. Some remarks of his had given him the idea, though he had never told him what the society was, nor how he had come to offend it. He could only suppose that the legend upon the placard had some reference to the secret society. How long were you with Douglas in California? asked Inspector MacDonald. Five years altogether. Was he a bachelor, you say? A widower. Have you ever heard of his first wife and where she came from? No, I remember her saying that she was a Swedish extraction, and I have seen her portrait. She was a very beautiful woman, and died of typhoid the year before I met him. You don't associate his past with any particular part of America. I've heard him talk of Chicago. He knew that city well and had worked there. I've heard him talk of the coal and the iron districts. He had traveled a good deal in his time. Was he a politician? Had the secret society to do with politics? No, he cared nothing about politics. You have no reason to think it was criminal? On the contrary, I've never met a straighter man in my life. <clears throat> was there anything curious in his life in California? He liked best to stay out and to work on our claim in the mountains. He would never go to where other men were if he could help it. That's why I first thought of someone was after him. Then he left so suddenly for Europe and I made sure that it was so. I believe that he was had a warning of some sort. Within a week of his leaving, half a dozen men were inquiring for him. What sort of men? Well, they were a mighty hard-looking crowd. They came up to the clam and wanted to know where he was. I told them that he had gone to Europe and that I did not know where to find him. They meant him no good. It was easy to see that. Were these men Americans? Californians? Oh, I don't know about Californians. They were Americans, all right. But they were not miners. I don't know what they were and was very glad to see their backs. And that was six years ago? An year of seven. And then you were together five years in California, so that this business dates back not less than eleven years at the least? That is so. It must be a very serious few that have kept up with such a earnestness for as long as that. It would not be... A light thing that would give rise to it. I think it shattered his whole life. It was never quite out of his mind. But if a man had a danger hanging over him and knew that it was, don't you think he would turn to the police for protection? 
Maybe there was some danger that he could not be protected against. There's one thing you should know. He always went about armed. His revolver was never out of his pocket, but by bad luck, he was in his dressing gown and had left in the bedroom last night. Once the bridge was up, I guess he thought he was safe. I should like these dates a little clearer, said MacDonald. It is quite six years since Douglas left California. You followed him the next year, did you not? That is so. And he has been married five years. You must have returned about the time of his marriage. About a month before. I was his best man. Did you know Mrs. Douglas before her marriage? No, I did not. I've been away from England for ten years. But you have seen a good deal of her sense. Barker looked sternly at the detective. I have seen a good deal of him since, he answered. If I have seen her, it is not because you cannot visit a man without knowing his wife. If you can imagine that there was any connection... I imagine nothing, Mr. Barker. I am bound to make every inquiry which can bear some on the case. But I meant no offense. Some inquiries are offensive, Barker answered angrily. It's only the facts that we want. It is in your interest and everyone's interest that they should be cleared up. Did Mr. Douglas entirely approve of your friendship with his wife? Barker grew paler, and his great strong hands were clasped convulsively together. You have no right to ask such questions, he cried. What does this have to do with the matter you're investigating? I must repeat the question. Well, I refuse to answer. You can refuse to answer, but you must be aware that your refusal in itself is an answer. For you'd not to refuse if you had not something to conceal. Barker stood for a moment, with his face set grimly and his strong black eyebrows drawn low on intense salt. Then he looked up with a smile. Well, I guess you gentlemen are only doing your duty. After all, and I have no right to stand in your way of it. I'd only ask you not to worry Mrs. Douglas over the matter, for she has enough on her just now. I may tell you that poor Douglas had one fault in the world, and that was his jealousy. He was fond of me, no man could be fonder of a friend, and he was devoted to his wife. He loved me to come here and was forever sending for me. And yet, if his wife and I talked together, there seems any sympathy between us, a kind of wave of jealousy would pass over him, and he would be off the handle and saying the wildest things in a moment. More than once I have sworn off coming for that reason, and then he would write me such penitent, imploring letters that I just had to. But you can take it from me, gentlemen, as if it is my last word that no man has ever had a more loving, faithful wife and I say, also, no friend could be more loyal than I am. It was spoken with a fervor and feeling, and yet Inspector MacDonald could not dismiss the subject. You are aware, he said, that the dead man's wedding ring had been taken off of his finger. So it appears, said Barker. What do you mean by appears? You know it's a fact. The man seemed confused and undecided. When I said it appears, I meant that it was conceivable that he had himself taken off the ring. The mere fact that the ring should be absent, whoever may have removed it, would suggest to anyone's mind, would it not, that the marriage and the tragedy were connected. Barker shrugged his broad shoulders. I can't profess to say what it suggests, he answered, but if you mean to hint that it could reflect in any way upon his lady's honor... His eyes blazed for an instant, and then with an evident effort, he got a grip down on his emotions. Well, you are on the wrong track, that's all. I don't know that I have anything else to ask you at present, said MacDonald coldly. There was one small point, remarked Sherlock Holmes. When you entered the room, there was only the candle lighted upon the table, was it not? Yes, that was so. 
By its light, you saw some terrible incident had occurred. Exactly. You at once rang for help. Yes. And it arrived very speedily. Within a minute or so. And yet, when they arrived, they found that the candle was out and the lamp had been lighted. That seems very remarkable. Again, Barker showed some signs of indecision. I don't see that that is remarkable, Mr. Holmes, he answered after a pause. The candle threw a very bad light. My first thought was to get a better one. The lamp was on the table, so I lit it. And blew out the candle. Exactly. Holmes had no further question, and Barker had a deliberate look from one to the other of us, which had... As it seemed to me, something of defiance in it. Turned, and then left the room. Inspector MacDonald had sent up a note to the effect that he would wait upon Mrs. Douglas in her room, but she had replied that she would meet us in the dining room. She entered now, a tall, beautiful woman of thirty, reserved and self-possessed to a remarkable degree, very different from the tragic and distracted figure that I had pictured. It is true that her face was pale and drawn, like that of one of who had endured a great shock. But her manner was composed, and the finely moulded hand with which she rested upon the edge of the table was as steady as my own. Her sad, appealing eyes travelled from one to the other of us with a curious, inquisitive expression. That questioning gaze transformed itself suddenly into an abrupt speech. Have you found everything out yet? She asked. Was it my imagine that there was an undertone of fear rather than of hope in that question? We have taken every possible step, Mrs. Douglas, said the inspector. You may rest assured that nothing will be neglected. Spare no money, she said in a dead, even tone. It is my desire that every possible effort should be made. Perhaps you can tell us something which may throw some light upon the matter. I fear not, but all I know is at your service. We have heard from Mr. Cecil Barker that you did not actually see, that you were never in the room where the tragedy occurred. No. He turned me back upon the stairs. He begged me not to enter. He begged me to return to my room. Quite so. You had heard the shot, and you had at once come down? I put on my dressing gown and then came down. How long after was it hearing the shot that you were stopped on the stair by Mr. Barker? It had been a couple of minutes. It was so hard to reckon time at such a moment. He implored me not to go on. He assured me that I could do nothing. Then Mrs. Allen, the housekeeper, led me upstairs again. It was all like some dreadful dream. Can you give us any idea how long your husband had been downstairs before you heard the shot? No, I cannot say. He went from his dressing room and I did not hear him go. He did not the round of the house every night, for he was nervous of fire. It is the only thing that I have ever known him to be nervous of. That is the point which I came to, Mrs. Douglas. You have only known your husband in England, have you not? Yes. We've been married five years. Have you heard him speak of anything which occurred in America, and which might bring some danger upon him? Mrs. Douglas thought earnestly before she answered. Yes, she said at last. I have always felt that there was a danger hanging over him. He refused to discuss it with me. It was not from want of convenience in me. There was the most complete love and confidence between us. 
but it was out of his desire to keep all alarm away from me. He thought I should prude over it if I knew all, so he was silent. How did you know it, then? This is Douglas's face knit with a quick smile. Can a husband ever carry about a secret all his life, and a woman who loves him have no suspicion of it? I knew it in many ways. I knew it by his refusal to talk of some episodes of his American life. I knew it by certain precautions he took. I knew it by certain words he let that fall. I knew it by the way he looked at unexpected strangers. It was perfectly certain that he had some powerful enemies, that he believed they were on his track, and that he was always on his guard against them. I was so sure of it that for years I have been terrified if he ever came home later than was expected. I might ask, said Holmes, what were the words which attracted some of your attention? The Valley of Fear, the lady answered. That was an expression he has used when I questioned him. I have been to the Valley of Fear, and I am not out of it yet. Are we ever to get out of this Valley of Fear? I have asked him when I can see him more serious than usual. Sometimes I think that we never shall, he has answered. Surely you have asked him what he meant by the Valley of Fear. I did, but his face would become very grave, and he would shake his head. It is bad enough that one of us should have been in its shadow, he said. Please, God, it shall never fall upon you. It was some real valley in which he had lived, and something terrible had occurred to him. Of that I am certain, but I can tell you no more. And he never mentioned my name, any other names. Yes, he was delirious with fever once when he was hunting accident three years ago. Then I remember that there was a name that came continually to his lips. He spoke it with anger and a sort of horror. McGinty was the name. Bodymaster McGinty. I asked him when he was covered who Bodymaster McGinty was, and his whole body he was master of. Never of mine, thank God, he answered with a laugh, and that was all I could get out of him. But there is a connection between the body master McGinty and the Valley of Fear. There is one other point, said Inspector MacDonald. You met Mr. Douglas in a boarding house in London, did you not? And became engaged to him there. Was there any romance, any secret so mysterious about the wedding? Oh, there was romance. There is always romance. There was nothing mysterious. You had no rival? No, I was quite free. You have heard, no doubt, that this wedding ring has been taken. Does that suggest anything to you? Suppose that some enemy of his old life had tracked him down and committed this crime. What possible reason could he have for taking his wedding ring? There was an instant I could have sworn that the faintest shadow of a smile flickered over the woman's lips. I really cannot tell, she answered. It is certainly a most extraordinary thing. Well, we will not detain you any longer, and we are very sorry to put you in all this trouble all this time, said the inspector. There are other points, no doubt, but we can refer to you as they arise. She rose, and I was again conscious of that quick, questioning glance with which she had just surveyed us. What impression has in my evidence made over you? The question might as well have been spoken. Then with a bow she swept from the room. She is a beautiful woman. A very beautiful woman, said MacDonald thoughtfully. 
after the door had closed behind her. This man Barker has certainly been down here a good deal. He is a man who might be attractive to a woman. He admits that the dead man was jealous, and maybe he knew best himself what cause he had for jealousy. Then there's that wedding ring. You can't get past that. The man who tears the wedding ring off a dead man's... What did you say to it, Mr. Holmes? My friend sat with his head upon his hands, sunk in the deepest thought. Now he rose and rang the bell. Ames, he said when the butler entered. Where is Mr. Cecil Barker now? I'll see, sir. He came back with the moment to say that Mr. Barker was in the garden. Can you remember, Ames, what Mr. Barker had upon his feet last night when you joined him in the study? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. He had a pair of bedroom slippers. I brought him his boots when we went to the police. Where are the slippers now? They're still under the chair in the hall. Very good, Ames. It is, of course, important for us to know which tracks may be Mr. Barker's and which from outside. Yes, sir. I may say that I noticed that the slippers were stained with blood. So, indeed, were my own. Well, that is natural enough, considering the condition of the room. Very good, Ames. We will ring if we want you. A few minutes later, we were in the study. Holmes had brought with him the carpet slippers from the hall. As Ames had observed, both souls were dark with blood. Strange, murmured Holmes as he stood in the light of the window and studied the manageably. Very strange indeed. Stooping with one of his quick feline pounces, he placed the slipper upon the blood mark on the sill. It exactly corresponded. He smiled in silence at his colleagues. The inspector was transfigured with excitement. His native accent rattled like a stick upon railings. Man, he said. There's no doubt of it. Barker just marked the window himself. It's a good deal broader than in the boot mark. I mind you that it was a display foot, and there's the explanation. But what's the game, Mr. Holmes? What's the game? Ah. What's the game? My friend repeated thoughtfully. White Mason chuckled and rubbed his fat hands together in his professional satisfaction. I said it was a snorter, he cried. And a real snorter it is. <clears throat> Hi, Abby. How you doing? I have to finish this chapter before I can say anything. Sorry. Oh. Hmm. This won't go back on. There we go. Oh, shit. Today is full of horrible things. Talk to my camera. Knocked my camera down. Oh, knocked my phone down. Luckily, it landed on my foot, which also hurt. Foot. Ow. But chances are landing on my foot instead of the ground beneath it probably saved my phone, so I can't bitch too much, I guess. No, I can, but I wouldn't do any good. Man, that hurt. Mm. Mm. Excuse me. Let's see, what time do we have for... <sighs> Am I actually an ads? 
damn it. And see a warning for it. Why am I running ads? Are they visible? Are they like corner ads or are they full screen ads? I don't mind the like bottom of screen ads because they're not blocking anything and they don't kill audio. But why is it running ads? It hasn't even been a fucking hour yet. And I accidentally ran six freaking minutes of ads at the beginning of the stream. And as far as I know, I haven't lost connection many of the time, just... The stream itself didn't go down, just losing connection, right? Hold on, let me check. Yeah, first it still claims, so the re stream hasn't restarted. Sound alerts aren't working again. <sighs> oh, let's. Ad break's almost over. Sorry to anyone who missed part of the story, but Twitch ran ads that I wasn't expecting. Because I've already run six frickin' minutes of ads. And it's saying that I would got the pre-roll off for another 15 minutes, so I better get into this as fast as I can. Ah, oh, damn, it's going to be another long chapter. Anyway. Continuing. Chapter 6. A Dawning Light. Three detectives had matters of detail into which to inquire, so we returned alone to our modest quarters in the village inn. But before doing so, I took a stroll in a curious old world garden which flanked the house. Rows of very ancient yew trees cut into strange designs skirted it round. Inside was a beautiful stretch of lawn with an old sundial in the middle. The whole effect so soothing and restful that it was. Welcome to my somewhat jangled nerves. In the deeply peaceful atmosphere, one could forget or remember only some fantastic nightmare that darkened study with a sprawling, blood-stained figure upon the floor. And yet, as I strolled round it, I tried to seep my soul in a gentle balm. A strange incident occurred which brought me back to the tragedy and left a sinister impression on my mind. 
I had said that the decoration of the yew trees circled the garden. At the end, which was the farthest from the house, they thickened into a continuous hedge. On the other side of this hedge, concealed from the eyes of anyone approaching from the direction of the house, was a stone seat. As I approached the spot, I was aware of voices. Some remark in a deep tones of man answered a rip little ripple of feminine laughter. An instant later, I had come around the edge of the hedge, and my eyes lit upon Mrs. Douglas and the man, Miss Barker, before they were aware of my presence. Her appearance gave me a shock. In the dining room, she had been demure and discreet. Now all pretense of grief had passed away from her. Her eyes shone with the joy of living, and her face still quivered with amusement at some remark of her companion. He sat forward, his hands clasped and his forearms on his knees, with an answering smile upon his bold, handsome face. In an instant, but I was an instant too late. They resumed their solemn mask as a figure came into view. A hurry word or two passed between them, and then Barker rose and came before me. Excuse me, sir, he said, but am I addressing Dr. Watson? I bowed with a coldness which showed, I dare say, very plainly the impression which he had pronounced upon my mind. We thought it was probably you, as your friendship with Mr. Sherlock Holmes is very well known. Would you mind coming over and speaking to Mr. Douglas and myself, an instant? I followed him with a dour face. Very clearly I could see in my mind's eye the shattered figure upon the floor. Here, within a few hours of the tragedy, were his wife and his nearest friend laughing together behind a bush in a garden which had been his. I greeted the lady with reserve. I had grieved with her grief in the dining room. Now I met her appealing gaze with an unresponsive eye. I fear you think me callous and hard-hearted, she said. I shrugged my shoulders. It is no business of mine, said I. Perhaps some day you will do me justice, if you only realized. There's no need for Dr. Watson should realize, said Barker, exactly. As he has himself said, it is no possible business of his. One moment, Dr. Watson, cried the woman in a pleading voice. There is one question which you can answer with more authority than anyone else in the world, and it may very take a great difference to me. You know Mr. Holmes and his relations with the police better than anyone else can. Supposing that a matter were brought confidentially to his knowledge, is it absolutely necessary that he should pass it on to the detectives? Yes, that's it, said Barker eagerly. Is he on his own, or is he entirely in it with them? I really don't know that I should be justified in discussing this point. I beg, I implore that you will, Dr. Watson. I assure you that you will be helping us. Helping me greatly, if you will guide us to that point. There was a ring of sincerity in the woman's voice that, for an instant, I forgot all about her levity, and was moved only to do her will. Mr. Holmes is an independent investigator, said I. He is his own master, and would act on his own judgment directed. At the same time, he would naturally feel loyalty towards the officials who are working on the same case, and he would not conceal from them anything which would help them bring the criminal to justice. Beyond this, I can say nothing, and I will refer you to Mr. Holmes himself if you want fuller information. So saying, I raised my hat and went upon my way, leaving them still seated behind that concealing hedge. I looked back as I rounded the far end of it, and saw that they were still talking very earnestly together, and as they were gazing after me, it was clear that I was our interview at the subject of their debate. I wish none of their confidences, said Holmes, when I reported to him that had occurred. 
He had spent the whole afternoon at the manor house in consultation with his two colleagues, and returned about to five with a ravenous appetite for high tea which I had ordered for him. Not confidences, Watson, for they are mighty awkward when it comes to their arrest for conspiracy and murder. You think it will come to that? He was in his most cheerful and debonair humor. My dear Watson, when I've exterminated the fourth egg, I will be ready to put you in touch with the whole situation. I don't say that we have fathomed it. Far from it. But when we have traced the missing dumbbell... The dumbbell? Dear me, Watson, is it possible that you have penetrated the facts that the case hangs upon the missing dumbbell? Well, you need not to be downcast, for between ourselves... I don't think that either Inspector Mack or the excellent local practitioner have grasped upon the overwhelming importance of the incident. Our one dumbbell, Watson. Consider an athlete with one dumbbell. Picture yourself the unilateral development, the imminent danger of spinal curvature. Shocking, Watson, shocking. He sat with a mouthful of toast and his eyes sparkling with mischief. Watching my intellectual engagement, the mere sight of his excellent appetite was an assurance for success, for I had a very clear recollection of the days and nights without a thought of food, when his baffled mind had chafed before some problem was his thin, eager features became more attenuated with the asceticism of complete mental concentration. Finally, he lit his pipe, and, sitting in the single hook of the old village inn, we talked slowly and at random about his case, rather as one who thinks aloud than as one who makes a considered statement. Oh. A lie, Watson. A great, big, thumping, obtrusive, uncompromising lie. That's what meets us on the threshold. There is our starting point. The whole story told by Barker is a lie. But Barker's story is corroborated by Mrs. Douglas. Therefore, she is lying also. They are both lying and in a conspiracy. So now we have a clear problem. Why are they lying? And what is the truth which they are trying so hard to conceal? Let us try, Watson, you and I, if we can get behind the lie and reconstruct the truth. How do I know that they are lying? Because it is a clumsy fabrication which simply could not be true. Consider, according to the story given to us, the assassin had less than a minute after the murder had been committed to take the ring. Which was another ring, from the dad's man finger, to replace the other ring, a thing which he would surely have never done, and to put a singular card beside the victim. I say that this was obviously impossible, you may argue, but I have too much respect for your judgment, Watson, to think that you will do so, that the ring may have been taken before the man was killed. The fact that the candle had only been lit a short time shows that there had been no lengthy interview. Was Douglas, from what we hear of his fearless character, a man who would likely, likely be likely to give up his wedding ring at such short notice, or could we conceive that his giving it up at all? <laughs> but the gunshot was apparently the cause of death, therefore the gunshot must have been fired some time earlier than we were told. But there could be no mistake about such matters as that. 
We are in the presence, therefore, of a deliberate conspiracy upon the part of two people who heard the gunshot, of the man Barker and of the woman Douglas. When on the top of this, I am able to show that the blood mark upon his window sill was deliberately placed there by Barker in order to give a false clue to the police. You will admit that the case grows dark against him. Now we have to ask ourselves at the hour the murder was actually did occur. Up to half past ten, the servants were moving about the house, so it was certainly not before that time. At the quarter to eleven, they had all gone to their rooms, with the exception of Ames, who was in the pantry. I have been trying some experiments after you left this afternoon, and I find that no noise which Mr. MacDonald can make in the study can penetrate to me in the pantry when the doors are all shut. It is otherwise, however, from the housekeeper's room. It is not far down the corridor, and from it I could vaguely hear a voice when it was very loudly raised. The sound from a shotgun is to some extent muffled when the discharge at very close range, as it was doubtfully done in this instance. I would not be very loud, and yet, in the silence of the night, it should have easily penetrated to Mrs. Allen's room. She is, as she has told us, somewhat deaf. And, but, the, nonetheless, she mentioned that, in her evidence, that she did hear something like a door slamming half an hour before the alarm was given. Half an hour before the alarm was given would be a quarter to eleven. I have no doubt that what she heard was the report of the gun, and that this was a real incident of the murder. If this is so, we now have to determine what Mr. Barker and Mrs. Douglas, presuming that they were not actual murderers, could have been doing from quarter to eleven, when the sound of the gunshot brought them down, until a quarter past eleven when they rang the bell and summoned the servants. What were they doing, and why did they not instantly give the alarm? That is the question which faces us, and when it has been solved, we will surely have gone some way to solve our problem. I am convinced myself, said I, that there is an understanding between those two people. She must be a heartless creature to sit laughing at some jest within a few hours of her husband's murder. Exactly. She does not shine as a wife, even though in her own account of what occurred. I'm not a whole souled admirer of womankind, as you are aware, Watson. But my experience of life has taught me that there are few wives having any regard for the husbands who would let any a man's spoken word stand between them and the husband's dead body. I should never marry Watson. I should hope to inspire my wife some feeling which would prevent her from being walked off by a housekeeper, when my corpse is lying within a few yards of her. It was badly stage-managed, for even the rawest of investigations must be struck by the absence of the usual feminine adulation. If there has been nothing else, this incident alone would have suggested a prearranged conspiracy to my mind. You think, then, definitely, that Barker and Mrs. Douglas are guilty of the murder? There is an appalling directness about your questions, Watson, said Holmes, shaking his pipe at me. They come at me like bullets. If you put it that Mr. Douglas, Mrs. Douglas and Barker have the truth about the murder and are conspiring to conceal it, then I can give you a whole-souled answer. I am sure they do. But your more deadly preposition is not so clear. Let us for a moment consider the difficulties which stand in the way. We will suppose that this couple are united by the bonds of a guilty love, and that they have determined to get rid of the one man who stands between them. It is a large supposition, for discreet inquiry among servants and others has failed to corroborate in any way. On the contrary, there is a good deal of evidence that Douglases were very attached to each other. That I am sure cannot be true, said I, thinking of the beautiful, smiling face in the garden. Well, at least they gave that impression. However, we will suppose that they are an extraordinarily astute couple, who deceive everyone at the, on this point who conspire to murder the husband. He happens to be a man over whose head some danger hangs. We only have their word for that. Holmes looked thoughtful. I see, Watson. You are sketching out a theory by which everything they say can be beginning false. According to your idea, there was never any hidden menace or secret society in the Valley of Fear or Boss McSomebody or anything else. 
Well, that is a good sweeping generalization. Let us see what this brings us to. They invent this theory to account for the crime. Then they play up the idea of by leaving the bicycle on the park as proof of the existence of some outsider. The stain on the windowsill conveys the same idea. So does the card by the body, which might have been prepared in the house. All that fits your hypothesis, Watson. But now we come to the nasty, angular, uncompromising bits which won't slip into their places. Why a cut-off shotgun of all weapons? And an American one at that? How could they be so sure that the sound of it would not bring someone onto them? It's a mere chance, as it is, that Mrs. Allen did not start out to inquire about the slamming of the door. Why did your guilty couple do all this, Watson? I confess, I can't explain it. Then again, if a woman and her lover conspire to murder her husband, are they going to advertise their guilt by ostentatiously removing his wedding ring after his death? Does that strike you as very probable, Watson? No, it does not. And once again, if the thought of leaving the bicycle concealed outside had occurred to you, would it really have seemed worth doing when the dullest detective would naturally say this is an obviously blind, as the bicycle was the first thing which the fugitive needed in order to make his escape? I can conceive of no explanation. And yet there should be no combination of events for which the wit of man cannot conceive an explanation. Simply as a mental exercise, without any assertion of this to be true, let us indicate the possible line of thought. It is, I admit, mere imagination, but how often is imagination the mother of truth? We will suppose that there was a guilty secret, a really shameful secret, in the life of this man Douglas. This leads to his murder by someone who is, we will suppose, an Avenger, someone from the outside. This Avenger, for some reason, which I confess is still at a loss to explain, took the dead man's wedding ring. The vendetta, which conceivably date back to the man's first marriage, and the ring be taken for such a reason. Before this Avenger got away, Barker and the wife had reached the room. The assassin convinced them that any attempts to arrest him would lead to the publication of some hideous scandal. They were convertly to this idea, and preferred to let him go. For this purpose, they probably lowered the bridge, which can be done quite noiselessly, and then raised it again. He made his escape, and for some reason thought that he could do so more safely on foot than on his bicycle. He therefore left his machine where it could be discovered until he had safely gotten away. So far we are within the bounds of possibility, are we not? Well, it is possible, no doubt, I said with some reserve. We have to remember, Watson, that whatever occurred is certainly something very extraordinary. Well, now, to continue our suppositions case, the couple, not necessarily a guilty couple, realize after the murder is gone that they have placed themselves in a position in which it may be difficult for them to prove that they had not to do it themselves, either the deed or be connivative at it. They rapidly and rather clumsily meet the situation, the mark was put on Barker's bloodstained slipper on the window sill to suggest how the fugitive got away. They obviously were the two who must have heard the sound of the gun, so they gave the alarm exactly as they sh would have done, but a good half an hour after the event. And how do you propose to prove all this? Well, if there was an outsider, he may be traced and taken. That would be the most effective of all proofs, but if not, well, the resources of science are far from being exhausted. I think that an evening alone in the study would help me much. An evening alone? I propose to go up there presently. I have arranged it with his estimable Ames, who is by no means wholehearted about Barker. I shall sit in the room and see if its atmosphere brings me inspiration. I'm a believer in the genius Loki. You smile, friend Watson. Well, we shall see. By the way, do you have that big umbrella of yours, have you not? It is here. Well, I'll borrow that, if I may. Certainly, but what a wretched weapon. If there was danger... 
Nothing serious, Watson. I should certainly ask for your assistance, but I'll take the umbrella. At present, I am only awaiting the return of our colleagues from Tunbridge Wells, where they are most presently engaged in trying for a likely owner to the bicycle. As nightfall, before the Inspector MacDonald and White Mason came back for their expedition, and they arrived exultant, reporting a great advance in our investigation. Man Hull admit that there were no doubts that there was ever an outsider, said MacDonald. Well, that's all past now. We've had the bicycle identified, and we have the description of our man. So that's a long step on our journey. It sounds to me like the beginning of the end, said Holmes. I'm sure to congratulate you both with all my heart. Well, I started from the fact that Mr. Douglas had seemed disturbed since the day before, and when it, he had been at Turnbridge Wells. It was at Turnbridge Wells, then, that we had become conscious of some danger. It was clear, that, therefore, that if a man had come over with a bicycle, it was from Turnbridge Wells that he might have expected to have come. We took the bicycle over with and showed it at the hotels. It was identified at once as by the manager of the Eagle Commercial that it belonged to a man named Hargrave, who had taken a room there two days before. This bicycle and a small van were his valise were his whole belongings. He had registered his name as coming from London, but had given no address. The valise was London made and the contents were British, but the man himself was undoubtedly American. Well, well, said Holmes gleefully. You have indeed done some solid work whilst I was sitting spinning the hairs with my friend. It's a lesson in being practical, Mr. Mack. Aye, it's just that, Mr. Holmes, said the inspector with satisfaction. But this may f all fit in with your theories, I remarked. That may or may not be, but let us hear the end, Mr. Mack. Was there nothing to identify the man? So little that it was evident that he carefully guarded himself against identification. There were no papers, no letters, no markings upon his clothes. A cycle map of the country lay upon his bedroom table. He had left the hotel and after breakfast early in the morning on his bicycle, and no more had heard from him until our inquiries. That's what puzzles me, Mr. Holmes, said White Mason. If the fellow did not want a hue and cry raised over him, one would imagine that he would have returned and remained the hotel as an inoffensive tourist. As it was, he must know that he will be reported to the police by the hotel manager, and that his disappearance will be connected by, with the murder. So one would imagine. He still has been justified by his wisdom to date at this rate. He has not yet been taken. But his description, what of that? MacDonald referred to his notebook. Here we have it so far as they could get it. They don't seem to have taken very particular stock in him, but still the porter, the clerk, and the chambermaid are all agreed about this. That covers the points. He was a man about five foot nine in height, fifty or so years in age. He has his hair slightly grizzled, a grayish mustache, a curved nose, and a face which all of them described as fierce and forbidden. Well, by the expression, that might be almost a description of Douglas himself, said Holmes. He is just over fifty, with grizzled hair, a mustache, and about the same height. Did you get anything else? He was dressed in a heavy gray suit with a reefer jacket and wore a yellow, sh short yellow overcoat with a soft cap. What about the shotgun? It is less than two feet long and it could very well fit it into the lease. How could he, he could have carried it inside the overcoat without any difficulty. And how do you consider that all this bears upon the general case? Well, Mr. Holmes, said MacDonald, when we have our man, you may be sure that I had his description on the wires within five minutes of hearing it. We shall be able to judge. But even as it stands, we have surely gone a long way. We know that an American is calling himself Hargrave, came to Tunwell Bridge Wells two days ago with a bicycle and a valise. 
and the latter was a sawn-off shotgun, and so he came with a deliberate purpose of crime. Yesterday morning, he set off from his place upon his bicycle with a gun concealed in his overcoat, and no one saw him arrive, so far as we can learn. But he need not pass through the village to reach the park gates, and there are many cyclists upon the road. Presumably, he at once concealed the cycle upon the ledge, uh, uh, ledge where it was found, and possibly lurked there himself, with his eye on the house, waiting for Mrs. Douglas, Mr. Douglas to come out. The shotgun is a strange weapon to use the inside of a house, but he intended to use it on outside, and then it was very obvious its advantages, as it could would be impossible to miss it. So the sound of the shots is so common in the English sporting neighborhood that no particular notice would be taken. That is very clear, said Holmes. Well, Mr. Douglas did not appear. What was he to do next? He left his bicycle and approached the house in the twilight. He found the bridge down and no one about. He took his chance, intending, no doubt, to make some excuse if he met anyone. He met no one. He slipped into the first room that he saw and concealed himself behind the curtains. From thence he could see the drawbridge go up, and he knew that his only escape was through the moat. He waited until a quarter past eleven when Mr. Douglas, upon his usual nightly round, came into the room. He shot him and escaped as ranged. He was aware that the bicycle would be described by the hotel people and a big clue against him. So he left it there and made his way to some other means to London or to some place hiding, some safe hiding place, which he had already arranged. How is that, Mr. Holmes? Well, Mr. Mack, it is all very good and very clear as far as it goes. That is the end of your story. My end is that the crime was committed half an hour earlier than reported that Mrs. Douglas and Mr. Barker are both in a conspiracy to conceal something, that they aided the murderer's escape, or at least that they reached the room before he escaped, and that they fabricated evidence of his escape through the window, whereas, in all probability, they had themselves let him go by lowering the bridge. That's my reading of the first half. The two detectives shook their heads. Well, oh, Mr. Holmes, if this is true, we only tumble out of one mystery into another, said the London inspector. And in some ways, the worst one had White Mason. The lady has never been to America in her life. What possible connection could she have had to an American assassin which would cause her to shelter him? I freely admit the difficulties, said Holmes. I propose to make a little investigation of my own tonight, and it is possible that it may contribute something to the common cause. Can we help you, Mr. Holmes? No, oh, no. Darkness and Dr. Watson's umbrella. My wants are simple, and Ames, the faithful Ames, no doubt will stretch to a point to me. All my lines of thought lead me back invariably to one basic question. Why should an athletic man develop his frame upon so unnatural an instrument as a single dumbbell? It was late that night when Holmes returned from a solitary excursion. We slept in a double-bedded room, which was the best that the little country inn could do for us. I was already asleep when I was partly awakened by his entrance. Well, Holmes, I murmured, have you found out anything? He stood beside me in silence, a candle in his hand. Then the tall, lean figure inclined towards me. I say, Watson, he whispered. Would you be afraid to sleep in the same room as a lunatic, a man with softening of the brain, an idiot whose mind has lost his grip? <laughs> Not in the least, I answered in astonishment. Ah, that's lucky, he said. Not another word did he utter that night. <laughs> Holmes is admitting this case is driving him crazy. <laughs> I'm curious why my things aren't working. Let's have a look in on that. Uh, that's not the one I need. I need this one. That's this one. Oh.
Where's it? That's one. No, it's not that one. Okay, it says it's supposed to be active. Ah, there we go. Now I can get my switches. I'm not saying it's supposed to be doing it. Where the hell are my switches? Very delayed switches. Okay. Of course, it's rubbing my eye. <laughs> okay, let's send my sound alerts to the wrong source. <sighs> Because I can't have good things going on. Come on. Yes, authorized. Duh. Ah. <sighs> Okay, I heard them. Did you hear it? <laughs> and my browser is lagging horribly. Okay. I don't get the feeling this is going to be another case of I'm hearing it, but it's not broadcasting.
so I'll have to check the mod later too. I'm going to... Oh, I've only got one more chapter left. Let's see, it's... How long is it? This chapter is... 15 pages. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and... run a three minute ad, just so... hopefully I can get through this without any more ad interruptions. And in the meantime, I will tinker with sound. So, see you in a bit. And of course, that's seeing you in a bit is for people who aren't subbed. <laughs> Okay, I didn't even hear it that time. What the hell? Sound alerts, why must you vex me so? Okay, I'll hear it when I don't have audio control over it. But is it broadcasting? Okay, take it off the monitor and see if I hear it again. What the hell? Okay, I'm to do it on me. I'm still hearing it. I'm hearing the full length and duration of my illustrious womb. I heard that one. There is a massive delay from when I hear it, from you guys hear it. At least when I sit on stream. 
So are you hearing all the howling? Because I switched it to monitor on monitor only, which I guess I needed to have output only. I need to hear the output though. This output should be what you guys hear. Should. Why the hell is broadcasting on TV so much easier than trying to broadcast on the internet? I Man, I'm freaking licensed TV producer. I can't do this shit. It worries me. That was loud. We're still on ads. Check Killer's connection real quick. Oh, uh, someone gifted Killer sub. Damn it, forgot. No, she doesn't have a sub right now. Killer doesn't have a sub. Sound alert says. Okay, she's not in ads right now. So. Okay, hopefully the ads are over, and then I can get back to reading. Just gonna get the screen back up. Okay. <clears throat> Our last chapter for the night, and the last chapter for part one, the tragedy of Brillstone. Chapter 7, The Solution Next morning after breakfast, we found Inspector MacDonald and Mr. Mason, White Mason seated in close consultation in a small parlor of the local police sergeant. Upon the table in front of them were piled a number of letters and telegrams, which they were carefully sorting and docketing. Three had been placed upon one side. Very true. Still on the track of the elusive bicyclist, Holmes asked cheerfully, What is the latest on the ruffian? MacDonald pointed ruefully at to his heap of correspondence. He is at present reported in Leicester, Nottingham, Southampton, Derby, East Ham, Richmond, and fourteen other places. In three of them, East Ham, Leicester, and Liverpool, there is a clear case against him, and he has actually been arrested. The country seems full of fugitives in yellow coats. <laughs> Dear me, said Holmes sympathetically. Now, 
Mr. Mack and you, Mr. White Mason, I wish to give you a very earnest piece of advice. When I went into the case with you, I bargained, as you will no doubt remember, that I should not present you with the half-proved theories, but that I should remain, retain and work out my own ideas until I had satisfied myself that they were correct. For this reason, I am not at the present pr moment telling you all that is in my mind. On the other hand, I said that I would play the game fairly by you, and I do not think that it is a fair game to allow you for one unnecessary moment to waste your energies upon a profitless task. Therefore, I am here to advise you this morning, and my advice is to you is summed up in three words. Abandon the case. MacDonald and White Mason stared in amazement at their celebrated colleague. You consider it hopeless, cried the inspector. I consider your case to be hopeless. I do not consider that it is hopeless to arrive at the truth. But the cyclist, he is not an invention. We have a description, his valise, his bicycle. The fellow must be somewhere. Why should we not get him? Yes, yes, no doubt he is somewhere, and no doubt we shall get him. But I would not have you waste your energies in East Ham or Liverpool. I am sure that we can find some shorter cuts to the result. You are holding something back. It's hardly fair of you, Mr. Holmes. The inspector was annoyed. You know my methods of work, Mr. Mack, but I will hold it back for the shortest time possible. I only wish to verify the details in one way, which can very readily be done, and then I take my bow and return to London, leaving my results entirely at your service. I owe you too much to act otherwise, for in my own experience I cannot recall any more singular and interesting study. This is clean beyond me, Mr. Holmes. We saw you when you returned from Turnbrig Wells last night, and you were in general agreement with our results. What has happened since then to give you a completely new idea of the case? Well, since you ask me, I spent, as I told you that I would, some hours last night in the manor house. Well, what happened? Ah, I can only give you the very general answer to that for the moment. By the way, I have been reading a short but clear and interesting account of the old building, purchasable at a modest sum of one penny from the local tobacconist. Here Holmes drew out a small tract, embellished with the rude engraving of the ancient manor house, from his waistcoat pocket. It immensely adds to the zest of an investigation, my dear Mr. Mack, when one of the conscious sympathy of the historical atmosphere was one's surroundings. Don't look so impatient, for I assure you that even so bold an account on this raises some sort of picture of the past in one, one's mind. Permit me to give you an example. Erected in the fifth year of the reign of King James I, and standing upon the site of a much older building, the manor house of Burlstone presents one of the finest surveying examples of the moated Jacobian residence. And making a fool of us, Mr. Holmes. Tut, tut, Mr. Mack. The first sign of temper I have detected in you. Well, I won't read it verbatim, since you feel so strongly upon the subject. But when I tell you that there is some account of the taking of the place of Parliamentary Council in 1644, of the concealment of Charles for several days in the course of the Civil War, and finally of a visit there by the second George, you will admit that there are various associations of interest connected with this ancient house. I don't doubt it, Mr. Holmes, but this, what, that is no, no business of ours. Is it not? Is it not? Breadth of view, my dear Mr. Mack, is one of the essentials of our profession. The interplay of ideas and the oblique uses of knowledge are often the extraordinary interest. You will excuse me these remarks from one who, though a mere connoisseur of crime, is still rather older and perhaps more experienced than yourself. I admit, I'm the first to admit that, said the detective heartily. You get to your point, I admit, but you are such a deuced round-the-corner way of doing it. Well, well, I'll drop the past history and get down to the present-day facts. I called last night, as I have already said, at the manor house. I did not see either Mr. Barker or Mrs. Douglas. 
I saw no necessity to disturb them, but I was pleased to hear that the lady was not visibly pining, and that she had partaken in an excellent dinner. My visits were specifically made to the good of one Mr. Ames, with whom I had exchanged some amiabilities, which culminated in his allowing me, without reference to anyone else, to sit alone for a time in the study. "'What? With that?' I ejaculated. "'No, no, everything is in order now. "'You, had, you gave permission from that, Mr. Mack, as I was informed. "'The room was in its normal state, and in it I passed an instructive quarter of an hour. "'Well, what were you doing?' "'Oh, not to make a mystery of so simple a matter. "'I was looking for the missing dumbbell. "'It has always bulked rather than large in my estimate of the case. "'I ended up by finding it. "'Where?' "'Ah, there we come to the edge of the unexplored. "'Let me go a little further, a very little further, "'and I promise you that I shall share everything that I know.' "'Well, we're bound to take you on your own terms,' said the inspector. "'But when it comes to telling us to abandon a case, "'why in the name of goodness should we abandon the case?' For the simple reason, my dear Mr. Mack, that you have not got the first idea what it is that you are investigating. We're investigating the murder of Mr. John Douglas of Burlstone Manor. Yes. Yes, you are. But don't trouble to trace the mysterious gentleman upon the bicycle. I assure you that it won't help you. Then what do you suggest we do with that? I will tell you exactly what to do, if you will do it. Well, I'm bound to say I've always found you had a reason behind all your queer ways. I'll do what you advise. And you, Mr. Mason White? The country detective looked helplessly from one to the other. Mr. Holmes and his methods were new to him. Oh, if it is good enough for the inspector, it is good enough for me, he said at last. Capital, said Holmes. Oh, then, I should recommend a nice, cheery country walk for both of you. They tell me that the views of Brostone Ridge over the Wald are very remarkable. No doubt lunch could be got in some suitable hostelry, though my ignorance of the country prevents me from recommending one. In the evening, tired but happy. Man, what are you giving us, a joke? asked MacDonald, rising angrily from his chair. <laughs> well, well, spend the day as you like, said Holmes. Patting him cheerfully on the shoulder. Do what you like and go where you will, but meet me here before dusk without fail. Without fail, Mr. Mack. <sighs> that sounds more san like sanity. All of it was excellent advice, but I don't insist, so long as you are here when I need you. But now, before we part, I want you to write a note to Mr. Barker. Well, I'll dictate it, if you like. Right, eh? Dear sir, it has struck me that it is our duty to drain the moat, and the hope that we may find some... It's impossible, said the inspector. I made inquiry. Tut, tut, my dear sir. Do please do what I ask you. Well, go on. In the hope that we may find something which may bear upon our investigation. I have made arrangements, and the workmen will be at work early tomorrow morning diverting the stream. Impossible! Diverting the stream. So I thought it best to explain matters beforehand. Now, sign that, and send it by hand upon four o'clock. At that hour we shall meet again in this room. Until then, we can each do what we like. For I can assure you that this inquiry has come to a definite pause. <laughs> The evening was drawing when we were reassembled. Holmes was very serious in his matter, curious myself, and the detectives obviously cynical and annoyed. Well, gentlemen, said my friend gravely, I am asking you now to put everything to the test with me, and you will judge for yourself whether the observations which I have made justify the conclusions to which I have come. It is a chill evening, and I do not know how long our expedition may last. So I beg that you will wear your warmest coats. It is the most importance that we should be in our places before it grows dark. So, with your permission, we will get started at once. 
We had passed along the outer bounds of the manor house park until we came to a place where there was a gap in the rails which fenced it. Through this we slipped, and then, in a gathering gloom, we followed Holmes until we had reached a shrubbery which lies nearly opposite the main door and the drawbridge. The latter had not been raised. Holmes crouched down behind a screen of laurels, and we all three followed his example. Well, what are we to do now? asked MacDonald with some gruffness. Possess our souls in patience, and make as little noise as possible, Holmes answered. What are we here for at all? I really think you might treat us with more frankness. <sighs> Holmes laughed. Watson insists that I am the dramatist in real life, he said. Some touch of the artist wells up within me, and calls insistently for a well-staged performance. Surely our profession, Mr. Mack, we would be drab and sordid if we did not sometimes set the scene as to glorify our results. A blunt accusation, the brutal tap on the shoulder. What can one make of such a denouement? But the quick interference, the subtle traps, and a clever forecast of coming events, the triumphant vindication of bold theories. Are these not the pride and the justification of our life's work? At the present moment, you thrill with the glamour of the situation and the anticipation of the hunter. Where would that thrill be if I had been as definite as a timetable? I only ask a little patience, Mr. Mack, and all will be clear to you. Well, I hope the pride and justification and the rest of it will come before we get a death of cold, said the London detective, with comic resignation. We all had good reasons to join him in the aspiration, for our Virgil was a long and bitter one. Slowly the shadows darkened over the long, somber face of the old house. A damp, cold reek from the moat chilled us to the bones and set our teeth chattering. There was a single lamp over the gateway and a steady globe of light in the fatal study. Everything else was dark and still. And how long is this to last? asked the inspector suddenly. And what is it we're watching for? I have no more notion than how long it is to last, Holmes answered with some asperity. If criminals would always schedule their movements like railway trains, it would be certainly more convenient for us all. And to what it is, we, well, that's what we are waiting for. As he spoke, the yellow light in the study was obscured by somebody passing to and fro before it. The laurels among which we lay were immediately opposite the window, not more than a hundred feet from it. Presently it was thrown upon with a whining of hinges, and we could dimly see the dark outline of a man's head and shoulders looking out into the gloom. For some minutes he peered forth in a furtive, stealthy fashion, as one who wishes to be assured that he is unobserved. Then he leaned forward, and in the instant silence we were aware of his soft lapping and agitating water. He seemed to be stirring up the moat with something which he held in his hand. Then suddenly he holds something in as a fisherman lands a fish, with a large round object which obscured the light as he dragged it through the open casements. Now, cried Holmes, now! We're, upon all, we're all upon our feet, staggering after him with our stiffened limbs, while he, with one of those outflames of nervous energy which would make him on occasion both the most active and strongest man that I have ever known, ran swiftly across the bridge and rang violently at the bell. There was a rasping of bolts from the other side, and the amazed Ames stood there in the entrance. Holmes brushed him aside without a word, and followed, us all, followed by us all, rushed into the room which had been occupied by the man whom we had been watching. The oil lamp on the table represented the glow which we had seen from the outside. It was now in the hand of Cecil Barker, who held it towards us as we entered. Its light shone upon his strong, resolute, clean-shaven face and his menacing eyes. "'What the devil is meaning in all this?' he cried. "'What are you after, anyhow?' Holmes took a swift glance round and pounced upon the sodden bundle tied together with a cord which lay where it had been thrust under the writing table. This is what we're after, Mr. Barker, this bundle, weighed with a dumbbell. 
which you have raised from the bottom of the moat. Margaret stared at Holmes with amazement in his face. How in thunder came you to know anything about it, he asked. Simply that I put it there. You put it there? You? Perhaps I should have said, replaced it there, said Holmes. You remember, Inspector MacDonald, that I was somewhat struck by the absence of the dumbbell. I drew your attention to it. But with the pressure of other events, you hardly had time to give it the consideration which would have enabled you to draw the deductions from it. When water is near and the weight is missing, it is not far-fetched supposition that something has been sunk in the water. The idea was at least worth testing. So with the help of Ames, who admitted me into the room, and the crook of Dr. Watson's umbrella, I was able to last night fish up and inspect this bundle. It was of the first importance, however, that we should be able to prove who placed it there. This will be accomplished by the very obvious device of announcing that the moat would be drained tomorrow, which had, of course, the effect that whoever had hidden the bundle would most certainly withdraw it in the moment that darkness enabled him to do so. We have no fewer than four witnesses as to who it was who took advantage of the opportunity, and so, Mr. Barker, I think the word lies now with you. Sherlock Holmes put the sopping bundle on the table beside the lamp and undid the cord which bound it. From within he extracted a dumbbell, which he tossed down to its fellow in the corner. Then he drew forth, forth a pair of boots. American, as he perceived, he remarked, pointing to the toes. Then he laid upon the table a long and deadly sheath knife. Finally, he unraveled the bundle of clothing, comprising of a complete set of underclothes, socks, a grey tweed suit, and a short yellow overcoat. The clothes are remarkable and commonplace, remarked Holmes, save only for the overcoat, which is full of suggestive touches. He held it tenderly towards the light, whilst his long, thin fingers flickered over it. Here, as you perceive, is an inner pocket prolonging into the lining, in such a fashion as to give ample space for a truncated fowling piece. The tailor's tab is on the neck. Neil, the outfitter, Vermessa, USA. I have spent an instructive afternoon in the Vector's library and have enlarged my envelope by adding the fact that Vermessa's is a flourishing little town at the head of one of the best-known coal and iron valleys in the United States. I have some recollection, Mr. Barker, that you associated coal districts with Mr. Douglas's first wife and it would surely not be too far-fetched for the influence of the V.V. upon the card from the dead body which might stand for Vermissa Valley. Oh, that is the very valley which sends forth emissaries of murder. May that be the Valley of Fear which is well heard. Such is fairly clear. And now, Mr. Barker, I seem to be standing rather in the way of your explanation. It was a sight to see Cecil Barker's expressive face during this exposition of the great detective. Anger, amazement, consultation, and indecision swept over him in turn. Finally, he took refuge in somewhat acid irony. You know a lot, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps you had better tell us some more, he sneered. I have no doubt that I could tell you a great deal more, Mr. Barker, but it would come with a better grace from you. Oh, you think so, do you? Well, I can say that if there's any secret around here, it's not my secret, and I am not to give man to give it away. Well, if you take that line, Mr. Barker, said the inspector quietly, we must keep you in sight until we have the warrant and can hold you. You can do what you damn well please about that, said Barker defiantly. The proceedings seemed to have come to a definite end so far as he was concerned, for one had only look at the granite face to realize that no pianoforte de artura would ever force him to plead against his will. The deadlock was broken, however, by a woman's voice. Mrs. Douglas had been standing listening in the half-open door, and she now entered the room. Hmm. You've done enough for us, Cecil, she said. Whatever comes of it in the future, you have done enough. 
Enough, and more than enough, remarked Sherlock Holmes gravely. I have every sympathy with you, madam, and I should strongly urge you to have some confidence in the common sense of your jurisdiction, and to take the place voluntarily into your complete confidence. It may be that I myself am at fault for not following up the hint which you conveyed to me through my friend, Dr. Watson, but at the time I had every reason to believe that you were directly concerned in the crime. Now I am assured that this is not so. At the same time, there is much that is unexplained, and I should strongly recommend that you ask Mr. Douglas to tell us his own story. Mrs. Douglas gave a cry of astonishment at Holmes's words. The detectives and I must have echoed it, when we were aware of a man who seemed to have emerged from the wall, and who advanced now from the gloom from the corner in which he had appeared. Mrs. Douglas turned, and in an instant her arms were round him. Barker had seized his outstretched hands. It's the best this way, Jack, his wife repeated. I'm sure that it's the best. Indeed, yes, Mr. Douglas, said Sherlock Holmes. I'm sure that you will find it best. The man stood blinking at us with a dazed look of one who comes from a dark into a light. It was a remarkable face. Bold gray eyes, a strong, short-lipped, grizzled mustache, and a square projecting chin, and a humorous mouth. He took a good look at us, and then, in my amazement, advanced to me and handed me a bundle of paper. I've heard of you, said he in an American voice which was not quite English, and not quite American, but was altogether mellow and pleasing. You are the historian of this bunch. Well, Dr. Watson, you've never had such a story as that pass through your hands before, and I'll lay my last dollar on that. Tell it your way, but there are the facts, and you can't miss the public so long as you have those. I've been cooped up two days, and I've spent the daylight hours, as much daylight as I could get in that rat trap, and putting the thing into words. You welcome them, you and your public. There's the story of the Valley of Fear. That's the past, Mr. Douglas, said Sherlock Holmes quietly. What we desire now is to hear your story from the present. You'll have it, sir, said Douglas. Can I smoke as I talk? Well, thank you, Mr. Holmes. You're a smoker yourself, if I remember right. And you'll guess what it is that'll be right sitting for two days with tobacco in your pocket and afraid that the smell will give you away. He leaned against the mantelpiece and sucked at the cigar which Holmes had offered him. I've heard of you, Mr. Holmes. I never guessed that I would meet you. But before you're through with that, he nodded to my papers. You will say, I've brought you something fresh. <laughs> Inspector MacDonald had been staring at the newcomer with the greatest amazement. Well, this fairly beats me, he cried at last. If you are Mr. John Douglas of Burlstone Manor, then whose death have we been investigating these past two days? And where in the world have you been sprung from now? You seem to come out of me like a jack-in-the-box. <laughs> ah, Mr. Max, said Holmes, shaking a reproving forefinger. You would not read the excellent local compilation of described of concealment of King Charles. People did not hide in those days without reliable hiding places. And the hiding place that has once been used may be used again. I dissuaded myself that we should find Mr. Douglas under this roof. And how long have you been playing this trick upon us, Mr. Holmes? The inspector said angrily. How long have you allowed us to waste ourselves upon the search that you know is an absurd one? Not one instant, my dear Mr. Mack. Only last night did I form my views of this case, as they could not be put to the proof until this evening. I invited you and your colleague to take a holiday for the day. Pray, what more could I do? 
When I found the suit of clothes in the moat, it at once became apparent to me that the body they, we had found could not have been the body of Mr. John Douglas at all, but must be that of the cyclist from Turnbridge Wells. And no other conclusion was possible. Therefore, I had to determine where Mr. John Douglas himself could be, and the balance of probability was that, with the connivance of his wife and his friend, he was concealed in the house, which he had conveniences for a fugitive, and uh, waiting quieter times, then he could make his final escape. <laughs> well, you figured that out all right, said Mr. Douglas approvingly. I thought I'd dodge your British law, for I was not sure how I stood under it. And also I saw my chance to throw these hounds once and for all off my track. Mind you, from first to last, I could have done nothing to be ashamed of, and nothing that I would do not do again. But you'll judge for yourselves when I tell you my story. Never mind warning me, Inspector. I've already stand pat in mind the truth. I'm not going to begin at the beginning. That's all there. He indicated it in my bundle of papers. And a mighty queer yarn you'll find it. It all comes down to this. There are some men that have good cause to hate me and would give their last dollar to know that they had got me. So long as I'm alive and they are alive, there is no safety in this world for me. They hunted me from Chicago to California, then they chased me out of America. But when I married and settled down in this quiet spot, I thought my last years were going to be peaceable. I never explained to my wife how things were. Why should I put her into it? She would never have a quiet moment again and would always be imagining trouble. I fancy she knew something, for I may have dropped a word here and a word there. But until yesterday, after you gentlemen had seen her, she never knew the rights of the matter. She told you all she knew, and so did Barker, for on that night when this thing happened, there was a mighty little time for explanations. She knows everything now, and I would have been the wiser man if I had told her sooner. But it is a hard question. He took her hand for an instant in the sun, and I acted for the best. Well, gentlemen, the day before these happenings, I was over in Tunbridge Wells, and I caught a glimpse of a man in the street. It was not only a glimpse, but I have a quick eye for these things, and I never doubted who it was. It was the worst enemy I had among all of them, one who has been after me like a hungry wolf after the caribou for all these years. I knew there was trouble coming, and I came home and made ready for it. I guessed I'd fight through it all right and on my own, and there was a time when my luck and all the talk of the whole United States... I never doubted that it would be with me still. I was on guard all that next day and never went out into the park. And it's as well, or he'd have had the drop on me with that buckshot gun on his before or after even I could have drawn on him. After the bridge was up, my mind was always more restful when that bridge was up in the evenings. I put the thing clear out of my head. I never figured on this gentleman in my house and waiting for me. But when I made my round in my dressing gown, as habit was, I had no sooner entered the study than I scented danger. I guess when a man has had dangers all his life, and I've had more than most of my time, there's a kind of sixth sense that waves a red flag. I saw the signal clear, and yet I couldn't tell you why. Next instant, I spotted a boot under the window curtain, and then I was high and plain enough. I just had just one candle that was in my hand, but there was a good light from the hall lamp and the open door. I put down the candle and jumped for a hammer that had left by the mantel. At the same moment he sprang at me, I saw a glint of a knife and he slashed at him with a hammer. I got him somewhere, for the knife trickled down on the floor. He dodged around the table as quick as an eel, and a moment later I had his, he'd got his gun from under his coat. I heard him cock it, but I had got hold of it before he could fire. I had it by the barrel, and he, and we wrestled for it all ends up for a minute or so. It was death to the man that lost his grip. He never lost his grip, but he got the butt downwards for a moment too long. Maybe it was just that I pulled the trigger. Maybe we just jolted it off of between us. Anyhow, he got both barrels in the face, and there I was, staring down at the, what was left of Ted Baldwin. 
I'd recognized him in the township, and over again he sprang at me. And by his own mother wouldn't recognize him, as I saw him then. I'm used to rough work, but I fairly turned sick at the sight of him. I was hanging to the side of the table when Barker came hurrying down, and I heard my wife coming. Then I ran to the door and stopped her. There was no sight for a woman. I had promised to come to her soon. I said a word or two to Barker, and he took it all at a glance. Then we waited for the rest to come along, but there was no sign of them. Then we understood that they could hear nothing, and that all that had happened was only known to ourselves. It was an instant that the idea came to me. I was fairly dazzled by the brilliancy of it. The man's sleeve was slipped up, and there was a banded mark on the lodge on his forearm. See here? The man whom we knew as Douglas turned up on his own coat, and showed off the round triangle within a circle, exactly like that which we had seen upon the dead man. It was the sight of that which startled me on it. I seemed to see it all clear at a glance. There was his height, and the fair and figure was about the same as mine. No one could swear to his face, poor devil. I brought down the suit of clothes, and in a quarter of an hour, Barker and I had put my dressing gown on him, and he lay as you found him. We tied all his things into a bundle, and I weighed them down with the only weight I could find and slung them out the window. The card he meant to lay upon my body was laying beside his own. My rings were put on his fingers, but when it came to my wedding ring, he held out his muscular hand. You can see for yourselves that I had struck my limit. I could not have moved it since the day I was married, and I would have had to take a file to get it off. I don't know anyhow that I would have cared to part for it, but if I'd wanted to, I couldn't. So we just had to leave that detail to take care of itself. On the other hand, I brought a bit of plaster down and put it where the wearing one myself had been in this instant. You slipped up there, Mr. Holmes, clever as you are, but if you had a chance to take off that plaster, you would have seen no cut underneath it. Well, that was the situation. If I could lie low for a while and then get away where I could be joined with my wife, we would have a chance to at least of having living in peace for the rest of our lives. These devils would give me no rest so long as I was above ground, but if they saw the papers that Baldwin had got his man, there would be an end to my troubles. I had much time to make it clear to Barker and to my wife, but they understood enough to make it able for me. I knew all, my about, I knew all about this hiding place, and so did Ames, but it never entered his head to connect it with the matter. I retired into it, and it was up to Barker to do the rest. I guess you will find... Can fill yourselves in what he did. He opened the window and made a mark on the sill to give the idea of how the murderer escaped. It was a tall order, but as the bridge was up, there was no other way. Then, when everything was fixed, he rang the bell for all he was worth. What happened afterwards, you know. And so, gentlemen, you can do what you please. But I've told the truth and the whole truth, so help me God. What I ask you now is, how do I stand by the English law? There was a silence, which was broken by Sherlock Holmes. The English law is, in the main, a just law. You will get no worse than your deserts from it. But I would ask you, how did this man know that you lived here, and how, did, how to get into your house, and where to hide to get to you? I know nothing of this. Holmes's face was very white and grave. The story is not over yet, he said. You may find worse dangers than English law, or even than your enemies from America. I see trouble for you, Mr. Douglas. You'll take my advice and still be on your guard. And now, my long-suffering readers, I will ask you to come away with me for a time, far from the Sussex Manor House of Burlestone, and far also from the year of the grace in which we made our eventful journey, which ended with the strange story of the man who had been known as John Douglas. I wish you to journey back some twenty years in time, and westward some thousands of miles in space, that I may lay before you a singular and terrible narrative, so singular and so terrible that you may find it hard to believe, that even as I tell it, even so did it occur. 
Do not think that I intrude one story before another is finished. As you read on, you will find that this is not so. And when I have detailed those distant events, and you have solved the mystery of the past, we shall meet once more in those rooms in Baker Street, where this, like so many other wonderful happenings, will find its end. Ouch. Okay. Ow. <clears throat> so that is the end of part one. <clears throat> and I'm probably going to go ahead and end, uh, end it for the night there. Because I would hate to get into the next story and I'd only read one chapter. And thank you everyone for came in. And my browser is frozen again. <laughs> and I kind of agree with you on the no one ever hearing about this one, Matsu, because honestly, I hadn't even remembered it until I put up the poll. <laughs> Uh, apparently there's a greetings in chat. Oh well. So now is the time we try to find someone to raid, and it looks like <clears throat> looks like Sophia's already ended, so I can't raid her. I'm pretty sure she was going to be over soon anyway. Uh... The desk is playing Starfield. Baffy is playing Persona. Anyone else have any suggestions? I think I know anyone else reading right now. No, Falco's reading. Is she reading? Turn of the screw. Okay, so she's not been streaming for an hour. It's not bad. Let's see, Oops. I'm waiting for her ads to be over. So let's go ahead and finish Falcor. Support our fellow storytellers. Okay. I do have both red messages, both for subscribers and for followers. If I can spell her name correctly. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
Let's see, does it work? Raid has been created. Cool. So, again, thank you all for coming in. I will go see you over in Falcorps. A uh, reminder, Subathon is the 26th, starting at noon central. And I will see you all over in Falcorps. And I haven't added my artwork here either. Oh, I'll see you over there, everyone. Have a good night, afternoon, morning, evening, whichever you might have.